was just saying that we were Welcome again to Signs of Destiny 2004. We're continuing our Saturday afternoon program. It's my pleasure this afternoon to introduce you from England, a geometer, a, I would say philosopher, he says thinker, but I think philosopher is really more accurate, young man who has spent at the last eight years studying the crop circles, particularly in England, and their relationship to sacred geometry. Uh, he is going to present in a very interesting, I think witty, and very intelligent way how there has been a secret coding in the crop circles over the last 25 years that he has discovered and what he feel, feels this may mean for us. So without further ado, I give you Alan Brown. Thank you very much for having me here and thank you all for being here. Um, We've got so, I've got so much to get through that it's going to be a whistle-stop tour, so I'm not going to waste any time on politenesses and nice, nicenesses. Can you hear me? Is that, is that any better? Yeah, okay. Um, now, there's been, there's been so many good talks so far, and so, so much of what has been said already from all different fields seems to feed into uh, both the crop circle phenomenon and, and what I want to be talking about. So it's hard not to be influenced by all these different things that are coming in. But the, the opening address where uh, Sean Randalls uh, talked about, well, read out the, the little uh, note that John Michel had written uh, in honor of John Mack. Um, and in that, in that little address that uh, John Michel wrote, he talked about uh, gathering in the Georgian Pilgrim after the Glastonbury Crop Circle Symposium, um, where we and I was lucky enough to be there with, with John Michelle and John Mack uh, sitting around a table. And uh, it was mentioned that John Mack had come over partly uh, with his growing interest in the crop circle phenomenon, but he had come over to uh, meet and talk with a guy called uh, Patrick Harper. Now, Patrick Harper's written a couple of seminal books, one, the first of, of which was called Daemonic Reality, and the second of which is his latest is that I've nicked for the title of my talk, which is The Philosopher's Secret Fire. And these books are extraordinary in the, in, in the way that they've basically re taken all the different elements from whole different fields, fairy folklore, UFOs, manifestations, apparitions, visions, shamanic journeys, and pulled it together in, in a most extraordinary um, cohesive uh, way of looking at this thing, which he's termed for a daemonic reality, which isn't demonic, it's daemonic. And daemonic is a title which, I mean, ha it has Greek origins, and, and it's not something that you can really define and say, this is what it is, and give, a, give an objective explanation. Similarly, as I find my experience with the crop circles, it's not something in, people come at it from lots of different angles, but, but my angle is has been the re growing realization that even though crop circles appear in more objective than any other phenomena that, phenomena that we've had in the past, that it actually shares the same central ambiguity, um, which is kind of both extraordinary and infuriating. And I just want to read a little quote by, um, by Patrick Harper, just to give you a sort of sense of, of how he's describing uh, his vision of, of how we could, we could look at this sort of thing. And he goes, in order to make the spiritual and the material worlds continuous, da daemons are often myth mythically depicted as comprising a long chain stretching between gods and men. But no matter how many links are added to the chain, making the spiritual ever grosser, the material, material ever more attenuated, 
there is always a point of discontinuity at which the spiritual ceases to be spiritual and becomes material, and vice versa. And not least of the da Damon's paradoxes is that they are simultaneously continuous and discontinuous with this world. Jung, the, uh, the psychologist, um, addressed this problem of daemonic events and causality with his concept of synchronicity, which he defined as an a-causal connecting principle. An inner psychic event and an outer physical one could be connected by meaning. Now, what I find with the crop circles is because they're so objective, we imagine that this must be something that's come in that we can objectively interact with, which is a part of a three, our 3D material reality. And indeed, the crop circle itself is there. It's, it's physically there. It's not like a UFO where you have to take someone's word that they saw what they saw. It's a physical event, yet when you try to get to the origin, origin of that event and when you try to make an objective analysis of that, it, it wavers and it wobbles and it's never as certain as you imagine it, it should be, be, being such a physical event. Now, um, I'm going to read a second quote by Patrick Harper, which again just adds a bit of, a bit of the flavour of the sort of head-scratching profundity of trying to get to grips with, with the crop circles. And he says, on this feeling that you're going mad and trying to get to the bottom of, of what's going on, he says, this is what demonic reality can seem like when we approach it in a manner that is too rational, too intense on explaining, too this-worldly. When we approach it, that is, when, that is in the archetypal style of Apollo, but the Apollo, Apollonic attitude constellates that of his brother Hermes, the patron of demonic reality itself. As god of borders, roads, and travelers, he is particularly evident on quests. As a trickster deity, he specializes in teasing us beyond endurance, leading us beyond all rational limits. He delights in baiting Apollonic consciousness by producing physical phenomena which seem like evidence for the literal reality of the demonic, only to leave us grasping at thin air. Now, I'm going to... Is this my slide? Okay, now, I've found uh, uh, the, the whole imagery connected to alchemy, for example, is to me very, very similar to, to, the, to what we see in the crop circles. Not literally the exact same symbols, but the flavor of alchemy. Um, now, one of the, the important things about alchemy was it, it split us into physical, the spiritual, and soul. Now, souls kind of been left out of the mix as we've moved into, um, especially Christianity was, was particularly strong at making the, the physical, the spiritual, and the, the place for soul has kind of been eroded. And now what Patrick Harp is saying is that soul is another way of describing daemonic reality, just as imagination is another way of describing daemonic reality. But the point is, Daemonic reality isn't subjectively internal any more than it is objectively external. There's a sort of bleed through where you're never sure whether your delusion is a revelation or, your, or the, what you believe to be a revelation is delusion. But somehow in this tug and pull comes the ability um, to loosen up from being too literal in imagining that this must be a definitive spiritual event or becoming too literal that this must just be a material event in itself. So it's, and what we find with alchemy is that, is that soul was central into the mix of the physical and the spiritual and soul. Now, one of the, this particular painting I just picked pretty much at random, but it, it shows this beautiful split of duality and cycles of heaven and time above. But you can see on the one side we have the sun, and the other side we have the moon, we have the lion and the stag, we have nighttime and daytime. We've got this interplay of duality. Now, sacred, one of the great things I find about sacred geometry, and, and which is the way that I, my path seems to have led into the crop circle uh, territory, is that you have certain graphic symbols in sacred geometry which seem to depict this kind of thing very, very accurately. Now, this is called the Vesica Pisces, and uh, 
John, Jen John Major Jenkins talked about this last night. Um, and again, you, you, you could say that the vesica Pisces represents the spiritual and the physical. And then you've got this, this area of overlap, which you could term the daemonic, which is belonging neither to either realm in its entirety, but somehow in that middle blend is, is where the real work and the real revelation occurs. Okay, and another great symbol of sacred geometry, which is very useful to us, is, the, is this called the squaring of the circle, and uh, this very famous uh, cartoon by Leonardo da Vinci uh, depicts this, where you, and, and again, it, it was, it's a very, very ancient, uh, ancient, not problem, but an ancient concept, where the square, the perimeter of the square, is brought into equivalence with the circumference of a circle. So, and, it, and the odd thing about the squaring of the circle is, is that it was eventually proved that you can't square the circle using the tools of the geometer, the compass and the straight edge. Um, it's a mathematical impossibility, but yet as, f as far back as we can go, w civilizations seem to have been grappling with this idea of squaring the circle. And in sacred geometry, the square is often uh, a symbol of the earthly, the material, the manifest, and the rational. And the circle is the spiritual, the, uh, the heavenly, the incommensurable. And so when you're squaring the circle by trying to bring these two polar opposites together, you, you're uniting, it's like oil and water, you're trying to bring them together. And we as human beings are essentially daemonic. We have a foot in both worlds. And it's through us, um, and that's with Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci showing us the human, generic human being. Um, it, we're the, like the crucible which, which these polarities are united in. And, uh, and what you find is the... Traditionally, the pentagram, which is, again, John Major Jenkins chatted about the, the, the pentagram and how it encodes um, the phi spiral and the golden mean, um, is, th is that, that symbol of us. We, we, when we stand spread eagled, have four limbs and a head, we, we are like the pentagram. So when we see the pentagram, in some contexts, we can read that, that that's symbolic of us. Now, Robert Lawler show, shows this example in his book, Sacred Geometry, an old uh, medieval stone carving. And what this shows is, is that, that that carving is linking together these, these very basic principles of the square, the circle, and the pentagram of us, again, depicting this union of opposites through us. OK. now. I'm very lucky to be working on a, a little booklet with, uh, with John Michel, whose work um, I was very familiar with over many years prior to getting into the crop circles. And uh, what, one of the great things about crop circles is it seems to always get you to meet the people that you need to meet. I had no, no idea John Michel was into crop circles when I first got into the subject. And now here I am co-authoring a book with him. But, um, John Michel, way back in 1968, brought out his book, The, New, the View Over Atlantis, in which he, he put down for the first time this seminal insight into the nature of, of number and uh, ancient measure, units of measure, and put, put down this comprehensive um, notion that numbers of time and measure and cycles and the basic way that basic number operates was like a universal principle that was used by all cultures from all times. And, uh, and central to this, uh, I mean, I've looked at it and looked and looked, and each time I go back to it, I, I see into it a bit deeper. And th this basic diagram that he set out in those early days um, is this notion that if you have a circle of radius 5040 units. It doesn't matter whether they're centimeters, inches, miles. It's this, this is just the property of number. Now, 5040 is 1 times 2 times 3 times 4 times 5 times 6 times 7. It's also 7 times 8 times 9 times 10. Now, 5040 is this, 
is a number, if you, if you read Plato, you'll see that he spoke about the ideal number of inhabitants of, uh, of his idealized city as 5,040 inhabitants. So clearly this was a number that was known about from ancient times. And when you, when you see it written like this, you can see what, what there's a kind of, there's an obvious link. This is the way number behaves. Now, if you have a radius of, of 5040, then that quarter, the, the circumference of that circle now is 7920, 8 times 9 times 10 times 11. Now, in order to, to find the circumference of the circle, you, you need to use pi. Now, as we know, pi is an infinite number. We've never got to the end of it. We found it to 50 billion places or something, and it still goes, is going on with no recognizable pattern within it. However, um, all the way through uh, time, we've used different approximations to, to make it practically usable. And one of the most uh, common one is 22 over 7, which gives you a, quite an accurate, uh, it's probably the simplest, uh, most accurate depiction of pi. And it's using 22 over 7, which, which makes this work. Okay, now what John Michel did is he then placed that circle that we've just looked at into this larger structure. Now, I don't know if there's a pointer that I can use, but um, you can see that the circle's held in a vesica Pisces, which is in turn held within a square, which is in turn held within a circle. Now, this, this is like a, a cosmic master plan diagram. Because what you find is when you do that, the area of the entire circle, which you can see up there, 47900160, is actually 1 times 2 times 3 times 4 times 5 times 6 times 7 times 8 times 9 times 10 times 11 times 12. Now, I mean, I find that extraordinary. That This is, this is an extraordinary, consistent, insightful um, look into the way number behaves, which seems to be as far back as we can look. People have recognized and used this. And John michel uh, believes that it, 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 was, it was this print, if you, if you wove this principle into your units of measure, into your whole, the whole way your, your society was set up, it would remain healthy and invigorated um, because of the, the natural behavior of the underlying number beneath it. And equally, that semicircle in the middle is 1 times 2 all the way up to 11. And that, that gives you that area. If you, if you looked at it a different way and you said the area of the central circle was 1, for example, then the area of the circle contained by the square would be 3, and the area of the whole thing would be 6. So it breaks down to these very basic num numerical proportions. And when you, have the, when you have the vesica Pisces, for example, the central circle could be extrapolated out left and right, and you'd have three circles contained within, within a middle one. So these numbers are reflected in both the area and the, the circumferences. Now, if we just go back to, back to that diagram that we first opened with. If we, rather than having the 7920 as a quarter segment of a circle, we could have it as a side of a square. So you could have a square of 792, 7920, 7920, 7920, 7920, 7920, like that. And what we find when we do that is that our original circle of 5040 is in squared circle relationship. That 5040 and 7920 create a squared circle. Now, if you do that, you could put your compass point in the outer circle and open your compass point so it touches the edge of the square and inscribe a circle. And that's been done on all four quadrants. Ah, oh, lovely, thank you. OK, we're in business now. OK, so that square there is 7920, 7920, 7920, 7920. The radius of that circle is 5040, all made up of basic numbers. That distance there is 1080. So in fact, that whole 
distance there would be 2160, which is double that radius. Now, this is probably one of the most extraordinary insights that I think we've ever received from, certainly in modern sacred geometry. And this is what John Michel discovered, is that if you take that exact same diagram that we've looked at, and you took the moon out of the sky and placed it in exactly the same proportion as it is against the Earth, you would create that exact same squared circle relationship. Moreover, the actual number, if in miles, the diameter of the Earth is, give or take a mile or two, is 7,920 miles, okay? And the distance from there to there would be 5,040 miles. Now, I mean, how do we get our heads around this? Why, why would it be the case that the units of measure which uh, traditional metrology would have us uh, believe that the mile is just a random measurement which may be loosely based on the on a average size of a human foot or an average stride, but why would the Earth measure 7,920 miles and 7,920 be 8 times 9 times 10 times 11? I mean, this is an extraordinary, extraordinary deep insight which... Again, th there's no rational way of approaching this. It's just, it's just a fact that this, this cosmological diagram unites the Earth and the Moon. But it doesn't end there, because what John Michel went, then went on to expound was that at Stonehenge, which, again, has been one of those centers of crop circle activity, um, is based on exactly the same cosmological principle. Now, that, uh, the famous stones that we know Stonehenge by, the lintel ring, is that one there, of which these have since fallen down, but that was once a complete circle. And then this inner circle of called blue stones. Now, these blue stones were dragged hundreds of miles from Wales uh, across land and sea at huge, unfathomable expense of energy in order to get them there. And there's all sorts of reasons why they, why they should have done so, which is a whole other field of study. But what you find is, is that if you put a circle around that, the circle of blue stones, and you put a square around that, the sarsen stone ring squares the circle again. Okay, now this, remember, the, the squared circle is the, is the union of the spiritual and the physical. Now, if that seems like a slight jump of, of association, we then discover that that distance there is 79.2 feet, and that distance from there to there is 50.4 feet. So just, it's exactly the same number. You move the decimal place around, but it's exactly the same pattern of numbers, 79.2 feet, 7,920 miles, or just the basic 7920 as a a build-up of basic number. Okay, now this is extraordinary, and there's many other examples. The, the, the earliest church of Glastonbury was set up uh, with exactly the same numerical proportion. If you look at the, uh, the book of Revelations and St. Jo John's vision of the New Jerusalem, that, it, that is given in cubits, and when flip, once you start to realize the meteorological units of measure associations and how they all link, that again is the same cosmological principle being laid down in a different system of measure. Moreover, the, uh, the Great Pyramid at Giza, if we take our squared circle, we can see if we put the pyramid in the square, that angle there, which unites the circle with the square, is exactly the elevation angle of the Great Pyramid. So we're, we're finding as far back as we, can, if we have any records in history that this system was recognized, was being used and utilized in the, in the construction of, of um, ancient monuments, sacred monuments. Okay, now we come to this formation which appeared at a place called Crooked Soli in, in Wiltshire uh, in 2002. Now, I mean, this is an extraordinary formation. When, when I first saw that, I was just blown away by its beauty. And, it, and it's, 
it's, I mean, you can see the combine harvesters at work there. This formation was, was there for a day before it was combine harvested out because it came so late at the end of the season. Uh, we'd had the big alien face with the disc, which had caused such a furore. Um, and then literally about two weeks later, this formation suddenly appeared out of the blue like a kind of late gift. And it was only spotted by a passing pilot who happened to fly from the same airfield where Steve Alexander, who takes a lot of crop circle photographs, flew from and said, oh, I saw a crop circle, you should go take it. So Steve went out and got a photograph. And if that little synchronicity hadn't occurred, we, we, we may never had ever had a record of this event. So it's not like, you know, you imagine if I, if I was to make this with a bunch of friends and, I, you know, this would take a huge amount of planning, you would have to work out the location and all, all the rest of it. You're not going to then make it and then stand back and let it be combine harvested out so no one sees it. You would have phoned someone up, even anonymous, anonymously, and said, you know, look, there's a crop formation there. So, so that in itself is extraordinarily telling. Um, moreover, it's until I started work on it just a few weeks ago, trying to actually work out where exactly it was, it, it's, it's never actually been known exactly whereabouts, and it was near Crooked Soli, but we didn't know exactly where it was in Crooked Soli. But luckily these photos with this very distinctive copse of trees, um, I was able to work out exactly where it is, and I'll go on to that in a second. Now, I feel like my role in the crop circles is, uh, is uh, and I come in as, a, as an artist, not as a scientist, and I draw the formations. I, every season I draw as many as I can of, of those ones which uh, significant, interest me enough in order to dedicate the amount of hours it takes to draw them. And uh, I mean, just a little technical point. I mean, again, I don't want to get into the objective. I, I believe technically any crop circle with enough thought, forethought and planning could be physically constructed. However, if you look at this, you can see that in order to construct a circle, you need to have a center point in order to, if you draw the comp compass, you need your center point. Now, this center point is way out in standing crop. I mean, the distance between there is 60 foot, on average, between uh, crops, uh, between tram lines. So, you know, this, this is... This is another layer of huge amount of difficulty. I mean, imagine trying to construct that in a, in a, in a night of darkness. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a phenomenal achievement if, if that's how it got there. And that, to my, my take on it, is that it doesn't matter how it got there. It's what it does. It's what we can extract from it once it's there. But it's, in, it's important to get a grip of how complex and how difficult these things are to construct, let alone envisage in the first place. Now, how would you go about, about drawing that? There's, in fact, there's, there's a couple of different ways, and I'm going to show you um, just one method of how, how you could do it. Oh, yeah. It's, as you can see, and Francine mentioned it this morning, this is a depiction of a rotating DNA spiral. And I was chatting to the uh, seminal crop circle geometer, John Martineau, the other day, and he said that he felt that this was a depiction of mitochondrial DNA, which is, a f I mean, I'm not a biologist, so I'm going on his, his word here, but mitochondrial DNA is the DNA that's passed down through the matriarchal line, and it's, it, it forms a closed loop with itself, as opposed to your regular nuclear DNA, which has again been depicted in a, in a crop circle, which has open ends. Okay, now, I, I, I believe this distinction is, is significant. Even if it's not factually significant, my interpretation of it, I feel, is significant. Now, there's all sorts of wonderful numerology that you can start working in here. There's 89 circles here, that, and 10 circles down the middle, 10 major circles. And, and the actual DNA spiral rotates at 36 degrees each, each time it twists. So by the time it's done a full cycle, it's moved through. Um, it, it's, like a, it's like looking down, and it would be like looking down in a, a, a it's a pentagram. So it's got that basic phi structure to it. Now, what we find here is that the, the pattern is broken by an additional circle that's, that's put in there, I believe, which makes the total count of circles 89 circles. And it's just a, a fact of mathematics that if you divide 1 by 89, you then uh, create the Fibonacci se sequence, which is 0, 0, 1, 2, 3, 
five eight, which is which is the which replicates the phi spiral. So it seems to be ref referencing the, symbolically in a diagram the, the nuclear DNA, but it's referencing its uh, its geometrical structure in in, a, in two different ways. And in no, I won't waste time on. Okay, so there's a drawing of it that I just did the other day. Okay, so this is how the, the one method of how, you, of how you'd go about constructing this, or how you'd draw it if you went to draw it on paper. You would, you would create a circle and you would ro rotate that circle 72 times around, around that central point. Now, 72 is a pentagram number, 36, 72. All the pentagram numbers always collapse back down to nine. So 36, three plus six is nine. 72, seven plus two is nine. Now, so it, again, it, it's clearly referencing phi in its construction. So you've got 72 circles rotated around like that, creating that sort of toroid structure. Now, if you just take that section and you discard that bit in there and that bit out there, you create this grid. Now, that's, that's the basic grid that the formation is constructed out of. The rest of it never appeared in the field. We only get to see this bit. Now, straight away, I wanted to add up how many of these little diamonds are in the lattice. And you can see around the edge, we've got a whole lot of half ones. So I count two of those as one square. Yeah, same on the inside. And when you do that, you find that you've got 1,296 possible squares, which is six to the power of four, I think. OK, and so the, the formation is constructed within that band that we've seen, made up of laid crop and standing crop. And I just want to show you how that another way of looking at that geometrically. If we had a circle, started with, you drew a circle, and you put a square in it, you put your compass point in the corner of the square and opened it up so your pencil was at that one, and you inscribed a circle. And then you did the same from that corner, that corner, that corner. You, you, we've just drawn four of the 72, but you can see where they cross there defines that circle, and where they cross there defines that circle. So this is a beautifully, beautifully harmonically balanced drawing, I mean, structure. OK. Now, in the field, the way it was sized is that you could put an equilateral triangle between that standing circle of crop in the middle and the outside circumference. Uh, remember that shape, because it's going to appear again. OK, but so we know that there's a, there's a grid of 1,296 possible squares. So of that possible available squares, how many were flattened to make the design, and how many were left standing? OK, hold your chairs. 792 flattened squares, 504 standing squares. OK? I mean, <laughs> I, <laughs> you, you're very sweet, but I didn't design it. I mean, if, you know, if someone had come up to me in the street with that draw, drawing on a piece of paper prior to it being a crop circle, and I had worked that out, I would, I would have been astonished. I mean, I don't know anyone who can design like that. I mean, imagine, I mean, I'm a designer and an artist, and I've, and I've been drawing crop circles. I mean, Bert's been doing crop circle geometry for years. John Martineau's been doing crop circle geometry for work. John Michel, we're all, the hoaxes all believe that we're designing the phenomenon, but we're not, and we don't know anyone who, who's capable of this level of, uh, of number. So, I mean, this is an extraordinary, extraordinary thing. It's like you get given the brief, okay, come up with a design that's got the numbers 792 and 504 in them. And then to come up with a solution, which is a perfect six-fold rotating DNA spiral, which you're then going to put in a crop in the outskirts of Hungerford on a Monday night. It's, do you know what I'm saying? It, it, it really, really taxes the brain.
Okay, that's just to remind you of, of how those numbers work. Okay, now, as I said, when I was starting to write this up with John Michel, I just had the feeling that I really want to know where, where this was in the landscape because inevitably crop circles appear at specific locations. There's a reason for their appearance of, of, of where they come. And, I, and so I spent ages on the map looking at this photograph and luckily this is a very distinctive copse of trees. And if we look at the Ordnance Survey map, we can see that that copse of trees is there. So we can see the formation fell about there. Now, that's Crooked Soli, and that's the name that's been attributed to its location. Now, once I'd found it on the map, I thought, I went, I went to, once when I was coming down to Wiltshire, I, I was passing nearby Crooked Soli, and I, went, I just went to Crooked Soli just to say a silent thank you to whoever put that there. And as I hit Crooked Soli, and this is a remote, remote sort of place right on the border of Wiltshire in, uh, and Berkshire, and uh, it's not a place that's ha had received many crop circles before. There have been a few down this way um, in the past, but this is kind of off the beaten track a bit. But when I went there, I know the first thing I realized when I found Crooked Soli was that there was a um, a footpath to a place called Straight Soli. And I thought, now, now this is really, da really daemonic, the straight crooked. And I just want to read a poem which was, uh, which was written by T.S. Eliot. And he, he, this is just a verse of it, and he goes, round and round the circle, completing the charm, so the knot be unknotted, the cross be uncrossed, the crooked made straight, and the curse be ended. And he was talking about the end of an epoch, the, the rebirth of a, of, of a new cycle of time. And I thought this was incredibly poignant that, that this I, and I found it, I found a similar quote reading Keats, that this, is, this clearly was quite an old adage of, of crooked and straight, that somehow we've gone through a period of becoming crooked and we're now coming out of a period of being straight. Um, that things are straightening out, that the wrinkles and the warps that have shifted, jolted us off our path are, are, are being restored, that ancient wisdom is being restored. And so I, f I found this incredibly telling that there was this duality between crooked soli and straight soli. And in fact, it goes on and on. East soli farm, west soli farm. There used to be an old farm west, the old, there is an old farm west soli, there used to be an old farm east soli. There's a king's coppice, there's a queen's coppice. Um, I mean, I, let me just find some of the, the names that I found, just in this small geographical area. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a new Hayward farm, an old Hayward farm. There's a new Hayward bottom, an old Hayward bottom. There was a north field, a south field. There was a w east lodge, a west lodge. There was an upper marsh and a lower marsh. There was an upper pow plowy, powerly and a lower powerly. A little hidden farm and a great hidden farm. A little west wood and a great west wood. So do you see, I mean, this, this extraordinary, it seems to be reflecting the basic nature of the duality of the square and the circle in the actual place name in the landscape. All these duality, I mean, I'm sure there's other places in the country that have a propensity of dual place names. But I find this extraordinary that this location has all the, there's, there's the, the wonder of the geometry of the formation itself, but then its position in the landscape seems to accentuate and, and underpin that basic insight of the, of the demonic nature of this. Okay, so the, the other important thing we're going to get back to is just there is the River Kennet. Okay, now this formation is actually as close to the River Kennet as it is to Crooked Soli. Okay, now having found where it is on the map, being a crazy geometer, I've started to geometrize the map. Okay, now he, he, here's an aerial photograph of the area. And there's Crooked Soli, there's Straight Soli, there's King's Coppice, and the formation was just about there. Now, if you put a circle that runs through Crooked Soli, Straight Soli, through the formation, they're actually spaced apart in exactly that relationship. 
So crooked soli is the same distance from straight soli as it is from the formation. The formation is the same distance from there as it is from there. It falls bang in the middle. It's, it rides the duality. It's uniting the crooked and the straight. Okay? And that, that basic geometry was reflected in the formation itself. Okay, now look at this field, field boundary there. I looked at that and I thought, now that is, that is kind of, I mean, that was, well, I was researching it, and that's been there since the 1700s. Okay. If you put a pentagram in there, <laughs> it, that leg of the pentagram runs up exactly that field division. Okay, now it's only when we put that, that hypothetical circle, which has been being made meaningful by the formation, that that would work. I mean, you could, put, you could create pentagrams all over the landscape, but the fact that that exact circle, which is created by that formation being there, suddenly makes that pentagram. I mean, you can see how the top of that wood there almost hits the crossing arm of that. I mean, that's deeply, deeply astonishing to me. Okay, now, the... You're going to have to excuse me. I'm going to say a naughty word, which I've got away with in England, and I hope I won't be put in Guantanamo Bay for saying it in America. But the River Kennet has its source at Silbury, by Silbury Hill. There's a, Swallowhead Springs is one of the springs right by Silbury Hill, which feeds into the Kennet. And the Kennet, as we saw, ran right below where that formation fell. Now, Silbury Hill has been like, ever since 1988, Silbury Hill has been one of the centers of the crop circle phenomenon. The circles are continually, every summer, found in the vicinity of Silbury Hill. And Silbury Hill is ancient. I mean, it's, it's way back into Neolithic time, 4,500 BC. It's, it's contemporary with the Great Pyramid. And it's the largest man-made or woman-made earth mound in Europe. And it's the symbol of the goddess. So in terms of our unfolding mythology, Silbury Hill, to me and to many people studying the subject, symbolizes, and it's been mentioned a number of times in other people's talks, this idea that we have moved into an, a, a, an era of Apollonic male analytical, of which I'm, <laughs> you know, I'm very analytical the way I work through crop circles. but, but it's, it, it's depicting an, an ancient, pre-Christian, pre-patriarchal way of living. And so the, the, the Kennet is, is like this, the stream which flows from it. Now, etymologically, the word Kennet used to be called Cunnet, and you take the eye out and you've got Cunt. And that, this isn't just a, um, a spurious association. This is archaeologically and... Uh, study that this is the origin of the word Kennet. And certainly, and right up into Hungerford, um, where the formation we saw fell, that little stretch of, of, of the Kennet from Silbury Hill to Hungerford retained the name of the Cunnet and the association of the Cunnet much later than anywhere else. There was like a lingering folk memory of the fact that the, the, the Kennet, the, the Kennet uh, River, um, was the Cunnet, was the Cunt, which was the flowing of the, uh, the Earth Mother. So, so I suddenly made the connection between the matriarchal DNA strand, which has passed down the female line. If you follow the, the, the Kennet right back to its source, and Swallowhead Springs is just there, that's where the water bubbles out, and it flows down there and on its way. So, I mean, this is an extraordinary, deep, rich symbolism that the, the Kennet should emerge by Silbury Hill, this great, huge figure of the goddess in the landscape, which has survived the ravages of time and is still there. Um, that this stream, is, it's like a... And let me just quote Michael Dames, who did a lot of this research on, on the Kennet. And he goes, the name of that orifice... Um, oh, no, he says... The... This river's, the Kennet's, winding course is like a thread leading back into the labyrinth of prehistoric belief. And it's the same, and that's reflected in the, in the line of the matriarchal DNA strand, which, which through the matriarchal line leads us back to the original Eve, 
we're, we're getting the symbolism of a, of a return, of a cyclical return to, a, to an age from the past. Okay, I'm going to, what time are we on? Okay, that's cool, we're, we're on course. Okay, so I just, I, I want to leave that, leave that with you now, but the point of that fact is, is, is that we, we can see that unequivocally the crop circles have referenced the squaring of the circle. Now, they've done it by number. There's no, there can be no um, confusion. As, like, if, you, if it was done by measure on the ground, someone could say, yeah, but it, was it 18 foot or 17.36 foot? And maybe it wasn't exactly squaring the circle. This was doing it with numbers that there was no doubt that this was talking about the squaring of the circle. OK, I'm now going to return to a, a, a different subject altogether, but it will tie itself in if we can get there by the end. And I'm going to return to a very early type of crop circle called the quintuplet. Now, one of the things that I've really enjoyed doing is going back and looking at very, very early formations which have long since been forgotten in the wondrous, huge, amazing, complex formations that we get now. Now, I mean, this, for example, was in 1983. So this was over 20 years ago. And it was called the quintuplet because it's like the five spots on a dice. You've got four satellite circles around the, the circumference and then a big mother circle in the middle. And the quincunx is, is again, that's uh, Jung, again, found that the this basic quincux pattern was spontaneously generated in, in the minds of, of people that he was working with on a psychological level. That it seemed to be a symbol, a symbol of the, uh, the transformation of self. And also in alchemy, the quintessence, which is a word we still use as meaning the most pure, the most, the essence of the pure essence of something, was we've got the four elements around the, around the outside. And the quintessence was the fifth element from which the four elements emerge and the four elements return to. So it was like the ethereal ether, um, which has now fallen out of usage. But it, it, it is in itself, it isn't a thing. It's the, it's the sum of what emerges from it. Um, and so, and this basic structure, in crop, when early days of crop circles, when we were just getting simple circles and sometimes maybe two or a scattering of circles, the quintuplet was the most uh, shocking uh, crop circle that we were getting because the current idea was that perhaps these were being created by random wind vortices, some poorly understood um, meteorological effect. But the, the, the quintuplet really challenged that hypothesis um, because it was going, how can, the, how can a weather do something so structured? We could understand the odd circle being the, a dust devil or a whirlwind or something, but this really tested um, that hypothesis to the max. And we got a lot of them. I'm just going to flick through a little slideshow of some of the types of uh, quintuplets that we've had. And it's, it's important to realize that apart from the simple circle, the quintuplet has been the most repeated design that we've had in the crop circles. For over 25 years, we've been getting quintuplets in one form or another. They've been getting more complex, they've been getting rings, the satellite circles have been getting bigger. But essentially, this pattern has been repeated and repeated and repeated down, down the years. And that's a great one of Pat Delgado, one of the early stalwart researchers on his ladder measuring it up. 1987, that was. And there we are, that's 1988. Suddenly, the phenomenon which was happening primarily in Hampshire suddenly moved into Wiltshire, right next to Silbury Hill. And from this m moment on, Silbury Hill would be one of those centers of, the, of crop circle activity. And these were, these were big, big quintuplets. And again, just, just lots of odd things. I mean, if you stand and look at that, look, look at those circles way out in standing crop. How do you get there? 
that little circle there, which isn't formed, which should have been part of that, was actually found over a badger's set, a little hole that badgers make in the ground. So it was like the energy that was putting the circle down hit a badger's hole and didn't quite do it. I mean, it, it, it puts pay to the idea that someone's traipsing around at night time and goes, oh, there's a badger hole. I know, I could trick them by, you know, it's, it, it, this, is, this is totally, these early quintuplets give you the impression of the grace and uh, the, the, sim the simple, powerful symbol uh, I'll just find another one. Yeah, here, here we occasionally got another circle below the bottom. And there we see some with rings starting to appear. I mean, that was uh, from 2000. And again, I mean, the, there the mother circle isn't flattened crop. It's an old Neolithic barrow, which is uh, a burial mound. And again, I mean, some things reference that beautiful way the tractors skirted around it and incorporated that into the design. I mean, that's again just a, just a beautiful bit of landscape placement, so artistically, and again, laying each corner out radially. So our, our traditional understanding is that, is that the quintuplets were depicting a very gradual evolution from simple quintuplets, getting a little bit more complex, getting a ring, sometimes two rings. And it was seen, it was seen as quite a, uh, a simple, slow development. OK, now, I've, I've been working closely with Terence Meaden, who was one of the early researchers into crop circles. Now, he was the one that was pushing the, the idea that it was a weather created by the weather. And his research has, has, has now been dismissed by a lot of people, but, the, the, but for, for all his shortcomings with his very uh, rigid scientific view was, of what was going on, to his unending credit, he was incredibly methodical about the way he, he surveyed these formations. And, and he's been sharing all these original surveys with me over the last year or two. And they're exquisite. They're, they're me each circle is measured in six directions. Um, I mean, just so much detail, the, the, what the weather condition was like on the night they were found, when they were found, who the farmer was, any, you know, I mean, it really is an incredible resource to have at my fingertips. And so I've, I've, I've pulled together, I've worked on 50, well, over 50 quintuplets, and I'm slowly pulling them together. And I mean, this is never, this graphic has never been seen before. This is, this is as far as I've got in collating chronologically all the quintuplets that we've, that we've had. And you can see how the, the mother circles and the satellite circles, all different sorts of combinations of, of sizes and relationships were, were going on. And you can see how the complexity is rising until we're getting strange things like the mother circles actually hitting the satellite circles there. And there we've got the satellites touching the mother circle and the ring appearing on the outside. And there we've got quintuplets within a quintuplet. It's like a fractal quintuplet, that one. Ending in 2002, which was the last quintuplet that we've had. We haven't had any, to my knowledge, since then. And these are just the ones that have appeared in in England. I haven't studied ones that have appeared in other countries. OK, now, now Michael Glickman, um, Michael Glickman, who's been responsible for many extraordinary insights into crop circles and their geometry, noticed something that made a seminal discovery about this formation here which appeared at Headbourne Worthy in 1997. And what he noticed was, was that if you connected up the centers of the satellite circles, you create a square. And then the mother circle actually lies in squared circle relationship with that hypothetical square. Yeah, you see, there's the mother circle, there's your circle. So you're squaring the circle if you connect those up. 
I then, dis many years later, discovered that if you put a square around the satellite circles, again, the inside of the ring squares the circle. So we've got a quintuplet that's made up entirely of squared circles. Now that, that little snippet of information just hovered around in the ether for a few years. And I was actually uh, laying out a, a little book that Michael Glickman was, was writing um, about the quintuplets. And he felt that the quintuplet, before we ever got a manifest straight line in a crop circle, which appeared in the 1990s with the pictograms of which is, we, we, you know, is an archetypal picture of your crop circle with this straight corridor, is that he felt the quintuplets were referencing the straight line by the fact that the structure of a quintuplet, the satellite circles were always an orthogonal relationship. There was like 90 degrees between them. So they were kind of referencing the square. And I just suddenly had a flash of insight. I suddenly thought, God, because this one squares the circle, I wonder if some of the other quintuplets are squaring the circle. Now, let me give you an example of how this could work. OK, this is from Alfriston in East Sussex in 1984. Now, what I realized was that it, if you took, imagine you take a squared circle as a template, and you took all your quintuplets, and you took this, this squared circle template, and you laid it over your quintuplets, the position and sizes of the satellite circles appeared the more I looked, the more excited I got, appeared to be sized and positioned in such a way that you could, you could lay this perfect, perfected squared circle template over them and they would fit. So do you see what I mean? If you, by having these circles exactly the size they are and the distance from the center that they are, you could construct a squared circle. So you see that in a field and you think, okay, that's, there's not much to that circle in the middle, four around the outside, but you take your squared circle template and you drop it over that, and it fits. Okay, here's another one from Gander Down in Hampshire in 1985. And you could do it this way as well. Now, because I've, I've wanted to just graphically keep the quintuplets vertical and horizontal, you can see that if you, I've put these faint ghost lines, one on the outside edge of the satellites and one on the inside, and then we've got a circle running through their centers. Now, if you put a circle running through their centers, you could place a square exactly touching the outside one, and again, it's a perfect squared circle. So if we rotated that squared circle 45 degrees, the square would touch and it would square the circle. And I thought, now oh, this, is, this is extraordinary. Here's another one, Goodwith Clapford in 1985. And this one does it this way. If you put the circle so it's touching the inside of the satellite circle, then the square touches the center of the satellite circle. So again, if you rotate it at 45 degrees, the square would be constructed like that. OK, now, this is, this is an extraordinary thing. The more I looked, the more examples I found of different ways of doing it. OK, and then I've made it easier in the following slides because I've just, these are just the ghost circles of that. So if you imagine those rotated 45 degrees, they would be like that. So the square goes around the satellites and the circle runs through the center. OK, good with Clapford, 1988. The square is held within the outside edge of the satellite circles. The circle is the inside edge of that ring. Look at this weird one from Kingsclear in 1996. Now this is, this is very ingenious. The, the square is constructed around the mother circle the circle runs through the center of the satellite circles. So there you've got a squared circle. However, this one, sorry, that slide's a little bit dark, but there's our first squared circle just shown lightly in there. Once you've constructed that, if you put a square around it, 
then suddenly the inside edge of that satellite ring squares the circle too. So that simple design's got two squared circles contained within it. Here's one from Somsing in East Sussex in 93. That's just a little internal shot. Okay, now again, this, this has two squared circles held within it. The square touches the inside of the satellite circle. The inside of the ring circles the square. So there's your circle, squared circle number one. If you then construct a square around that, that circle, then the outside of the satellite circle circles the square. Now you can see how beautifully proportioned that is in order to, in order to create those meaningful relationships. Okay, here's one from Bratton. Again, this was, I think, 1987. And you can see that's the combine harvesters harvested that, but you can still see an imprint of it in the crop. And you can see there was a lot of other activity happening in that field. And this one does it in a totally ingenious way, where it didn't, I thought, ah, oh, here's one that doesn't work, the exception that proves the rule. And, but in fact, it does work, because if you put a square in the center of the satellites, then they're so positioned and sized that where the satellite touches that square gives you the points to create a circle that circles the square. Okay, and just one last example from something, just to show you just how ingenious these solutions were. Now, here's one I thought definitely wouldn't work. Here's the square constructed on the inside of the ring. And I couldn't see any possible way that the circle could be used to circle the square until I put a square around the whole formation. And that pr provides like a, a mold which contains a circle which circles the square. And one final example, 2002. If you rotated that 45 degrees, it would perfectly fit in there. You put a square around it, circle around there, and you've got a squared circle. OK, so this is, this is a breakdown of all the different ways you could size and position a satellite circle to create a meaningful squared circle. Now, this, this, is, this was kind of an amazing discovery to think that Right from the word go, the, the deepest, yeah, actually you could change the, the projector, the carousel. Okay, thank you. Okay, this was, this was an, you're doing well. I know this is, this is quite in-depth work for four o'clock on a Saturday afternoon. But the, the point being that rather than just being these simple little quintuplets being scattered around, we seem to have, have a system which is encoding the most sacred structure and sacred geometry, the squared circle, right from the outset, this has been, appears to have been encoded into the, into the crop circles. Now, that's all... OK, so, so that, ex that explains kind of one function of it. But there's one other important insight that, that needs to come into the mix. And this was made by John Martineau way back in 1992 or something, he noticed that if you put a pentagram inside the center of that ring, it perfectly contained the mother circle. Furthermore, if you put a pentagram inside the mother circle, that circle that's contained there is the satellite circle. So suddenly, you've got this extraordinary system of geometrical relationships where there's a geometry will, will relate the mother circle to the position of the satellite circles, and then another further internal geometry will relate this, the satellite circle to the mother circle. Okay, you see there's like two steps. The outer one relates the position of the satellites to the mother circle, and the other one relates the size of the satellite circle to the mother circle. Okay, now that that suddenly opened up the whole way of looking at this, was that 
the mother circle was actually performing a specific geometrical function. It wasn't just randomly sized. There was a specific relationship between the sizes of the satellite circles and the sizes of the mother circle. Okay, now, I said when I started out that geometrically squaring the circle with a compass and ruler is a physical impossibility. All you can do is create as accurate as you can approximations to the squaring of the circle. Now, if I sent all of you out to try and find examples and textbooks of geometrical methods of squaring the circles, I reckon we'd be hard pushed to come back with six solutions, the most common of which, there are a few accurate solutions, 99.9% .9 accurate is, is certainly accurate enough for a geometrical construction. You wouldn't, it's thinner than the thickness of your pencil. So it would, to all intents and purposes, it, it, it solves the solution. Now, what I realized was that th what the quintuplets were doing was something way, way deeper than I'd originally realized. I feel that what the quintuplets are doing, they've outlined a geometrical system which has never, ever been noticed before. This is a completely unique geometrical system which has never arisen in the whole of geometrical history as far as, as, far as I can tell from all my research. This is a, a completely new system. And this is how it works. OK, say you, you, you have a circle. Well, you start with a circle there, and you move it to the left, and you move it to the right. Now, this is the Vesica Pisces shown in another way. Yeah? If you put your compass point there and opened it to there, you would inscribe a circle like that. And if you put your compass point in there and opened it to there, you would inscribe a circle there. So, that's your first, the first step as you create this Vesica Pisces. You then create a further one internally to the mother circle. So you, you started with that, then you did it internally. Now if you took that center circle that you've just created and you moved it out to your hypothetical circle that was appeared after you'd moved that out left and right, butted it up against that circle, you then create a squared circle. OK, now this is a solution which has never, to my knowledge, has never appeared before. It's, ne it's not in any geometry books. It's not in any maths book. Here we have an incredibly elegant solution, which is so simple that kids can do it. And it's incredibly accurate. In fact, so. In, I've studied 52 crop circle quintuplets, and I've got 52 unique solutions to squaring of the circle, all of which are accurate to 99.9% or more. Anything that was less, I didn't bother with. These are incredibly accurate. And, you know, so if, you, if you look in geometry books, you might find five or six. In here were 52 unique novel solutions in a wheat field. Okay. Now, it doesn't end there. Look at this. If you then put a circle through the center of your satellite circles and you construct a pentagram, the circle that goes through the arm crossing points of that pentagram gives you your ring. OK? If you put a square around your original circle, your mother circle, that ring that you've just constructed with the use of that pentagram creates another squared circle. Now that solution is 99.999% accurate. That's awesomely accurate. And just think how simple that was. Vesica Pisces, the most, Vesica Pisces, the most, one of the most important geometrical uh, structures. G Vesica Pisces out, Vesica Pisces in, pentagram, and you've already created two squared circles the second of which is more accurate than any squared circle that I've ever, any solution that I've seen again in any textbook. And it's so simple, it's using a Vesica Pisces and a pentagram. Why hasn't that been noticed before? Surely someone must have, and if they have, it's certainly the records hasn't come, haven't come down to us now. Okay, but it doesn't end there either. If you then put a square around the satellite circles, and you took that middle circle there, 
and you've placed it against that square, the circle that runs through the centre of that squares the circle again. Now, if that figure looks vaguely familiar, you're right. It's that. Okay, so that one, that one quintuplet contains three, three solutions to the squaring of the circle. It references the sun and the moon. It contains the pentagram, which is us. I mean, I find this seriously extraordinary. Okay, and so suddenly... Ten minutes, okay, cool. We're going to do it. <laughs> okay, and I, I just want... Five, okay, we're still going to do it. And, and really, I could show you 50 examples, but I'm not going to. I'm just going to show you two or three, just so you get an understanding of how the system works. And you've done brilliantly. It is hard going. And I, I mean, OK, Cheese Foot Head, 1983. Every, every construction you start in sacred geometry begins with a circle, symbolizing unity. From unity emerges multiplicity. OK, and look how simple these solutions are. I mean, this is, this is kids, I mean, I'm not a mathematician, I can't even do trigonometry. So it's not difficult. There's a circle, you put a pentagram in it, you've created your mother circle straight away. If you put a pentagram containing a pentagon, you create another small circle there. Now these three proportions are exactly the same. A pentagon inside a pentagram is exactly the same proportion as four nested squares is exactly the same proportion as two nested triangles. Whichever one you use, you create this central circle here, which you then pull out and place on the circumference of your original circle. And that's all there is to it. Suddenly, you, you've created all that you need to do to create a perfect squared circle. Well, 99.98% accurate or something. And there it is, laid over the actual formation in the field, just, just so you can see that, that that's how accurately it, 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 it overlays. Now, suddenly the quintuplet isn't just a very simple, maybe slightly complex wind vortice created thing. It's a completely new, novel geometrical device which has never been seen before which is referencing the squaring of the circle. Let's just look at another example. Uh, Alf Friston, uh, 84. You start with your circle. You construct a pentagram. It contains a circle. You then put a pentagon inside that circle, another pentagon inside that pentagon, another one inside it, another one inside it, another one inside it. So you've got a pentagram and five nested pentagons gives you a circle. If you take that circle out and have it butting up against your original circle, there's your quintuplet. And there's how it squares the circle. And those are just recapping the stages that we got there. So it's just a two-step it's just a two-step thing. Pentagram, pentagram, five nested pentagons, and bang, you've got a novel solution to squaring the circle. Again, I'm, we've never seen that before, but so simple. Good with Clatford, 85. I mean, that's a Busty Taylor's aerial shot, and you just get, see how beautifully that's laid. You start with your circle of unity. This time, you don't use a pentagram. You use nested squares. Three nested squares gives you your mother circle. You then use six nested pentagons inside that, gives you your, your satellite circle. Move it out to sit on the, your opening circumference. Bang, you've squared the circle. Easy as that. And there is the perfect solution laid over the actual formation. Now, you've got to understand that the, that the energy that was putting down these early quintuplets was not as controlled as what we're seeing now, which is what, which is what I think this system was introduced for. I think because the, 
if you actually study them closely, the satellite circles were never exactly the same size. They were never exactly at 90 degrees. There was a degree of fluctuation. But by having a system that once you'd understand how the system works, you're then able to go and actually it's like a key that you can unlock these early events because it's the, it's the geometrical system, it's the idea that, that, they wanted you to, that they wanted us to get. Another, another solution, this time using pentagrams and nested hexagons. And I work, you, you've got the idea now, and I'm just going to end with this one example, just because this was actually the least accurate of all the ones I did. It's only 98.8% ac accurate or something. But, but it's, its simplicity is so wonderful. If you started with a circle, you enclosed it in a square, and then you unfo unfolded that square like that, you create the inside and the outside edge of the ring, okay? You then, sorry. If you then took your central circle and you placed it on that inside ring, you've created the, crop, the, the quintuplet apart from the mother circle. Okay, so how does the mother circle sized? The mother circle is sized by if you put a square around your satellite circles and put a circle in it, and then you put a square inside that, and then a square inside that, you've created the mother circle. So this solution is created entirely by squares. Once you've done that, your squared circle sits on the inside of the ring, and it's that circle that contained the two nested squares that describe that. And there again, we can see, I've had to perspective correct it, the, the oblique photograph of the formation, so it doesn't quite fit, but you can see, again, how closely that actually does lie over the solution and the actual formation in the field. Okay, so we've got there, <laughs> and I hope that I've managed to portray the, the, the nature of how far-reaching this system is. It's, it's, something that, it's not something that we, that we found in a, in a geometry book, and we've then gone, hey, look, we can, get, we can fit this onto the quintuplets. This is a completely new system which has been taught to us. Now, however they got there, we're either, you're either going to have to say that if it was people making these, that there's been a master designer who's remained completely underground and secret for 25 years, continually encoding some far-reaching device, which is tantamount to saying we're talking about a higher, a higher consciousness, or that the random events, that this, this, the random structure of that particular shape generates a completely novel solution to squaring of the circle, which means that somehow it's embedded into the nature of aesthetic reality, which is almost as weird as, it, as if it's being put there by a higher consciousness. Whichever way you come in, it, come in at it from, whether you're a staunch materialist or a, or a mystically minded, the, the net result is the same. This is a completely new system which is showing us that we human being, the con our co consciousness, is the crucible which will alchemically join together the spiritual and the physical. Thank you. <laughs>